So, well, thank you for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think we're all spread out around the world here today. Um, so, I wanted to talk today about uh, our battery streak and our experience as a startup. And the background here, I think we all can appreciate the two painful truths we live with every day. The batteries power everything and everything takes too long to charge. I think we all suffer with that all the time. So a little bit about my background is um, I, this is my third startup. My first one was uh, machine vision technology uh, that serviced the hard disk drive market. Uh, second one was Tamar technology, which was primarily focused on the semiconductor industry where we sold optical metrology sensors and battery streak. The third one was formed specifically to commercialize uh, technology developed at UCLA. Uh, the technology was developed by Professor Bruce Dunn. Oh, I misspelled his name. Please don't anyone tell him I missed an N on his name. Uh, it's properly spelled D-U-N-N, uh, but the technology was uh, developed by uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Dunn and Sarah Tolbert. What's unique about this is we uh, basically make the electrodes into little sponges and uh, it allows for very fast charge. The technology is very interesting in that it, it generates virtually no heat in the charge and discharge process. Uh, it has very long life cycles and we can develop, we can build our equipment and our materials on standard, uh, industry standard equipment. So I wanna give a little disclaimer here. That I'm gonna say a lot of things, some of which might be considered offensive. I don't mean to. Uh, this is just my job. Um, it's uh, uh, just my perspective and my my experience in in the uh, in the startup world. So if I say something that someone disagrees with, I'll apologize in advance. But again, it's nothing personal. It's uh, it's just the way uh, I, I unfortunately have made a living. Um, starting a company is very stressful. It is generally not as fun or easy as it is romantically uh, considered in a lot of ways. Uh, but in some ways, we're also all entrepreneurs, whether you work for a big company or a small company, we're all starting new projects, we're starting new divisions, we're doing things that are all original. Uh, the difference is in a big company, you're generally better funded. So there's a recent survey that I ran across from someone uh, named Kylie Lobel, who surveyed a number of uh, startup companies and asked people why they started a company. And their three most common answers were pretty, pretty expected, I think. I wanna be my own boss. Uh, the second one was, I want the freedom. And the third one was, I wanna make millions of dollars. Well, that's all great, but it's also not true. When you have a company and you are in charge of it, everyone is your boss. Every customer is your boss, every vendor is your boss, and you don't get a once a year review, you get reviewed every day or every week. And as for the freedom you do, you have complete freedom. The freedom to come to work at six o'clock in the morning and the freedom to go home at 10 at night. And also you get to do that seven days a week because if you don't, it's not gonna go anywhere. And as for the millions of dollars, yeah, it all sounds good, but most startups fail and those that don't can provide a, a living, but most people, when you consider the lost salaries and benefits, um, a lot of times it's not a great trade-off in terms of money. Uh, everyone thinks of Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates as uh, standard entrepreneurs, but that's not really the standard outcome for most, most companies. So I kind of compare it to dining out. And starting a company is exactly the opposite of going to a nice restaurant. When you go to a nice restaurant, you're served a great meal, everything's done perfectly, the soup, the salad, the duck, which is impossible to get crispy, was perfectly crispy. The dessert was wonderful. And of course, every wine at every course was perfectly paired. So you get up from the table, everybody walks to the car and someone inevitably comes up with something wrong. The bread was stale. It's human nature, right? Everybody finds the one thing that's wrong. Well, a startup is exactly the opposite. It can be a great day. All your experiments failed. The customers are late paying the bills. All your bills arrive at the same time. Deliveries are late and the water heater broke. But you know what? It was still a great day because Apple sent you an email. 
And it only takes one thing, one positive thing to happen, and suddenly it's a great day. So I've often been asked, what's the secret of a startup? And there is a secret, but it's a very well-known secret. And it's very simple to say, and it's really hard to do. And that is priorities. There are some things that have to get done and other things that just don't. And it's human nature to do the things that you're comfortable with and put aside or, or put off the things that are not in your comfort zone. But you have to decide what's important and what's not important and only concentrate on the things that are. One of my first jobs out of college was with a startup. I was just a, an employee, but it was very important to the management that the carpet and the desks and the walls were all color coordinated. They all had to be this matching color of light purple. I have no idea where that came from, but that was very important. And sure enough, the company failed after about 18 months because they concentrated on all the wrong things. And early in my career, a wise old man told me, said, drew this diagram for me. Drew the words fast, cheap, good. Pick any two. You can get it fast. And you can get it good, but it won't be cheap. And if you get it cheap and you get it fast, it won't be good. And I think we have an analogous thing here in the battery world. And that is fast charge, fast discharge, and high capacity. Pick any two. That's all you get. And this is, I think, why we're all here today. We want all three. I think someday we'll get there. But today, I thought this was kind of just an interesting analogy. The, batter, the origins of Battery Streak, uh, we came from, as I mentioned, I was working at UCLA as a volunteer, as an entrepreneur in residence, I was helping companies, uh, excuse me, I was helping professors and students start a company. Uh, I was also at the time an investor in Act One. But while at UCLA, uh, I found one of my most important responsibilities was telling uh, people that when they started their company, they would not be a billionaire in three months. Generally, that wasn't well received, but that was my job. So, uh, Act One is a small venture capital company in Santa Monica, California, and they got together with UCLA and made me an offer I couldn't refuse. They said, we have a job for you. You will not get paid. You get really long hours. And by the way, the technology was still at lab scale. So there's still a lot of work to do. So how could I refuse? Our funding, we were backed by Act One, the, the venture capital company I mentioned, and two private investors. And to date, we've spent less than $2 million, which um, we think was pretty capital efficient. We've come a long way. And we are in the process of raising our Series A round. We hope to make an announcement soon. Uh, there's a lot of hurdles that we're going to discuss, but we've gotten over most of those, and hopefully we'll have an announcement in the near future. In the process of raising money, I had probably 100 meetings with venture capital funds and people, and I came across basically two, the two most common responses I got were, well, I know somebody in the battery world that lost a lot of money, so I'm not really interested. And the other thing that we ran across, the other answer or response was, well, come back when you're making money. And I said, well, if I'm making money, what do I need you for? But that's the venture capital world. I don't think I, I don't think in general they like taking risks um, the way they they act like they're very big risk takers, and I just think they're not. So some of the hurdles we've enc uh, encountered is uh, UCLA licensing. The licensing UCLA is a very big university. It's publicly funded. There are a lot of uh, constituents that have to be protected. There's funding that comes from the state. This funding comes from the federal government. Um, there's the employees, the intellectual property. Uh, there are just so many hurdles, so many things that have to be handled at, at a public university. And it took a very long time. We ended up uh, negotiating with them for about six months to get all the paperwork done. And probably 30 people had to sign off on it throughout the state of California. And it was, it was uh, quite an onerous task. Another problem was academic speed. And, and I don't mean this as an insult. I know there's a lot of people that are in academia 
on this call, and it's not an insult. The, what I wanted to point out is that in academia, there are, the, the professors have a lot of balls in the air, a lot of juggling. They're doing everything from their own research to peer reviewing other papers, and they have a, a teaching classes. They have a lot of things going on. So, whereas in my position, I only have one thing going on, and that's advancing the technology. So, we were working at different speeds, and then along comes COVID in the middle of uh, 2020, and uh, everything shut down. So, we immediately had to open up a, a new office and manufacturing facility. That took us about a month, and it was very difficult, and especially here in California, when there are um, all the environmental requirements and all the permits and things that have to be um, have to be uh, um, uh, applied for. And the last hurdle was customer education. When we first started talking about ultra fast charging, uh, it was kind of a novel thing. This was a number of years ago. Uh, we've been working with CVMM uh, for a number of years. And when we first started talking about fast charge, it was sort of a novel concept and people didn't know anything about it. In fact, one very big company who, who makes uh, per, uh, um, consumer electronics that a lot of us use, we showed them a sample, we gave them a demonstration, and they said, well, hey, we'd love to see it in an 18650 cell. And it's kind of, well, why? It's, uh, we're showing the technology, we're showing the performance. They said, yeah, 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 but you know, we like to see it in that format. Well, it was, it was a hurdle. This is a brief timeline of uh, what we did. We started in 2017, as I said. Um, at the time, we were making milligrams of anode material. And we advanced that to 2019, where we got to kilograms of our anode material. And through 2019 and 2020, we developed our nanostructure cathode material. Um, and Matt Lai and Prashant Jampani joined the, uh, joined the company. Both are superstars in their own right and have uh, done a great job over the last couple of years. And then COVID-19 hit and everything stopped. And not just us, the whole world. And this is a picture of the wall outside our building. And where you see the bricks, that's uh, from where I've been hitting my head against the wall. And uh, it's, it's, it's just been painful. <laughs> so success, well, I'm using the term loosely because like I mentioned earlier, you have to look on the bright side of things. We now have products being evaluated at power tool companies, electric vehicle companies, and consumer electronic companies. So in my mind, we made some, some good progress there. The evaluations take a tremendous amount of time, and we're finding out that what we thought customers wanted, we were a little bit off. So we've had to rejigger our, our thinking between um, uh, fast charge, fast discharge, things like that. I can't get in, go into a lot of details because a lot of that's proprietary and under NDA, but I think it's very important that no matter what you're building, always keep your eyes open and your mind open because you're probably going to be wrong. And then there's the 10x rule of thumb that we're, we're, we're still working on. And th that rule of thumb is when you have a new technology, you need to be 10 times better at something. Um, you got to be 10 times cheaper, 10 times faster, 10 times something, or some combination of the two. And that's why keeping your mind open and changing the configuration or the exact properties of your inventions is very important because that ratio can change. Our vision of the future, I think we share with everyone. Everyone here is here for the same reason. We want to improve the carbon footprint of the world. Pollution's clearly a problem. Electrification of electric vehicles uh, uh, is a big deal. Fast charge is one of the large, or charging time, I should say, is one of the largest impediments to electric vehicle adoption. <clears throat> if you can charge your electric vehicle, and that includes scooters, electric forklifts, obviously uh, cars, but trucks, everything should be able to charge in minutes, not hours. And when that's possible, then we can uh, it really will change the world. I think we also all believe that at some point batteries will outperform gas power. I don't think we're there yet, but I think we all see a path there and I think we will get there. Whoop, that didn't work. Um, well, <laughs> uh, the wonders of modern technology. Uh, the goal here is that everyone can own an electric vehicle and you can drive around the corner uh, at, at, to your gas station and drive up to a gas, uh, uh, excuse me, a battery pump that sits right next to the gas pump 
and you can fill your car up with battery power in minutes. And when that happens, then again, everyone can own an electric car and the world is gonna be in a much better place. Oh, there we go. And with that, I say thank you for your time. And if there's anything I can, uh, any questions I can answer, I'd be happy to. That's great, uh, David. Thank you very much for that very uh, interesting talk.